So I came out to visit your mining facility last year in January. And at that time, Bitcoin was at like $40,000 a coin. Everything was going well. I think your facility was mining like a million dollars a month in like some of those big months. Yeah. Have things changed since then? Oh, how things have changed. Yes, they have. So Bitcoin has gone down from 45,000 down to $15,000. Profitability of mining has dropped by 80% at least. The value of those machines has dropped tremendously. We're probably at that one facility now mining, we're, we're running a million, now we're mining 300,000, $400,000 worth of coins. So it definitely has come down a lot. We've even added more machines there. And we built out a new facility since we last spoke um, about a couple miles away. And that's scaled up, that's full now, and now we have two more facilities in the works. So like, how has that been like money-wise? Like, have you had to like, how have you been able to like, eat the cost of like the mining profitability going down? Yeah. So I would say the biggest thing for us is that we did not take on debt related to mining machines. So we do have we do have one investment in mining machines, but most of our investment is in the infrastructure that provides the services to people who want to mine. So what happened was these public companies, a lot of miners, they bought machines at eight thousand, nine thousand, ten thousand dollars, and didn't actually get a chance to plug in those machines fast enough for them to catch up with their money, to catch to return the profits, basically to catch up on their investment. We invested into infrastructure. So that infrastructure isn't as volatile and it's not as cash flow dependent on the Bitcoin price. We make a cut of what our clients make, but then also we have a business where we just make a cut on the energy, We're providing services. So we provide the services, we buy energy from one price and we provide an all in cost or all in solution to our clients. Okay, so yeah, that, that makes sense. So you're, you're kind of diversified in like how you're making money within within Bitcoin. Who have you seen like be the most affected by like these dips? Have you seen like people go out of business and like all that lately? Yeah, so we've seen, um, there's a miner in Dallas that just like left all those machines in his lease. We've seen um, miners like Riot have issues, miners like um, Iris Energy defaulting $100 million of machine loans, uh, Core Scientific, saying they might have to go bankrupt, Compute North filing for bankruptcy. So a lot of these big infrastructure projects, groups that were doing hundreds of megawatts or doing large, massive projects, those projects have long timelines. So for us, we're focused on small, modular projects, five megawatt range across Iowa. So we don't overextend ourselves. We're not buying things that we need to use in 18 months. We're focused on deploying capital in an environment where we can get cash flow within two months. And have you found like now be an opportunity to really expand? Because I know when, when I first went out to visit in January, prices for like mining equipment was crazy. Like everyone was trying to get into it. Have you found that now is more of an opportunity where like, you know, prices have dipped and everything? Yeah, so I would say I think now is a much better opportunity than when if you would have looked at the market anytime between now and January. Now, is it the best time to get in? Is it close time in the bottom? I don't know if it's the best time. I think we might have a few more months of downward pressure before we do have an increase in price, uh, which then will support the hash price. But the thing is, we're still looking out the halving two years from now. Machine prices are still, I believe, a little bit oversaturated and need to come down in price to be profitable and make sense. On average, like when buying machines, you want to try to calculate your ROI to be under like 200 days. Okay. And so what happened was, is like people are calculating the ROI, which is like what their expected ROI was versus the actual every single month or every single quarter since January has been a longer ROI than what you expected. So back in January, buying a machine, you might have expected a 12 month ROI. Now that ROI with that price is actually 50 months, 60 months. Really? So it really changes the dynamic of when to get into Bitcoin mining. There's four cycles of Bitcoin mining. You have your gold rush cycle, which is one we just got out of. Then you have your bear market kind of entering in where you're losing your profitability. Then you have a shakeout cycle where like you have people going bankrupt, people fire selling machines. Is that where we're at right now? We're right now in the shakeout. And then we have uh, an upward trend, which is like the next cycle between the shakeout and the halving event, which will then show an increase in price before we get to that gold rush again. Ideally, when you're in mining Bitcoin, you want to be doing it where you're selling your machines in the gold rush, you're selling your coins in the gold rush, and you're buying back right now when equipment is low, and when there's blood on the table and people are not wanting to invest capital. Yes. Yeah. And for sure, like having been in like the Bitcoin mining space for a while, like did you kind of do that during the gold rush cycle? Were you selling machines? Were you like selling some of your coins? Or like what were you doing during that time? So before this, I had like the investment of thesis of like long-term Bitcoin holders. So we were mining Bitcoin, putting on the balance sheet. And I looked at Bitcoin holdings, like we've lost over two and a half million dollars on our Bitcoin holdings since the $50,000 price point at least. 
So you're looking at these mark to market, and you're like, crap, it makes a lot more sense to play the market as well. And so now looking at Bitcoin mining company, as I transitioned from when we talked in January to today, I'm really focusing on cash flow for the business. Saying, okay, this opportunity, this has an infrastructure, it's industrial, there's a lot of cash flow opportunity here. And if you make it so that you have you know, two employees per site and you're very um, diligent with your cost structure, you can make this a, uh, attractive cash flowing business where 50 megawatts of mining hosting is cash flowing you like a million dollars in profit, mm. even after servicing your debt, even after covering your uh, expenses. And so that's kind of what we're looking to get to is build out these modular sites and focus on cash flow and, and returns to investors. For sure. Um, and like, when did you like first start Bitcoin mining? Back in 2013, correct? So I got into cryptocurrency in 2013. I bought my first miner, which was a Butterfly Labs jalapeno miner. It was five giga hashes. Now a miner today, he buys 140 tera hashes. 1,000 giga hashes is one tera hash. Damn, so it was weak. <laughs> it was weak. It wouldn't even like mine a Bitcoin day. Like, and by the time they actually shipped it, it was making nothing because they kept doing delays and delays and delays and Bitcoin got harder and harder and harder and they were a US company. That was the first time I bought, like Bitcoin miner I bought. And then I started GPU mining more, got into that, mined Ethereum, but mining like 500 Ethereum a day and then ASIC mining again with Bitcoin in Iowa and other places. For sure. So like you've been through these cycles before. Like, can you tell, talk to me about like the first time you were mining and like a huge bear market hit? Yeah. So I've been through probably three of these cycles. Um, in the, the one bear market I really remember was when we were mining Ethereum. So like at that point I was out of my house, the power bills were bigger and the numbers, you know, get bigger. When that happens, like you have to be able to make your bill payments. Cause like, Oh, I'm down 20 grand. Like, what am I going to do? I'm down a hundred grand in this bill. So be really cognizant of that energy prices. So we were running in North Carolina. We turned off, we ran those machines. We were points where we were like selling almost all of our Ethereum, like 2000, 4,000 Ethereum for the month of mining to pay our power bill. Really? And so you were really we were struggling with like 200 yeah, Ethereum left. And so really struggling. Then we went up to uh, Oregon, we we're mining there for a little bit. And then eventually that became unprofitable. And so we kind of turned everything off as we were turning off then, this was maybe back in 27, maybe 2019, 2018. Then the bull market happened again. It's like all that Ethereum profitability went up and we lost, I lost, now I missed out the opportunity to mine at those rates. So like what I've learned from mining is like, you wanna make sure that you're profitable in as many scenarios as possible with the lowest cost of electricity. You wanna make sure you're investing into machines when um, when when the market is, like I said, there's blood on the floor, when no one's buying, people are going bankrupt. It's actually when you wanna get in and you wanna get out when the media is talking about Bitcoin, when everyone's talking about Bitcoin mining because now the equipment is so overvalued that at that price, that machine's never gonna make the mine Bitcoin back, never gonna make the cash back. Now, of course, the Bitcoin that machine could mine, if you held that Bitcoin for five years, 10 years, it can pay it back, but on a shorter time frame, you're not gonna make money. So mining is really about playing those cycles because we do see as a physically derived, der derived like um, forward or contract for Bitcoin mining, it's a derivative function, like you're buying a machine that's gonna give you this many Bitcoins in the future. That's kind of the estimate of what you're making. So, so I know like during these cycles, a lot of people, like I guess like the more like mainstream crowd always is like, oh, Bitcoin's dead. Like it's never gonna come back up. What do you have to say to like those people who think that Bitcoin's never gonna go back up to the previous highs? What I would say is there's a reason why over the past 10 years it always has gone up. And it's not because the technology is changing. It's not because the CEO of Bitcoin said that there was a new product feature coming out. It's because it's resilient and it's the best way to store value across time and space. So Bitcoin mining is a massive industry that only can, is continuing to grow even when the price is being pushed down. Those are real world investments going into infrastructure across the world, electricity payments being every, made every day, every month for securing the Bitcoin network. So what I would say to people is that all these people are believing that these miners, even though they might not be as profitable as they were previously, they're still gonna make some money, they're still running a business, they're still collecting coins. Those coins have an intense, have inherent value because there's so much energy required to extract one. And so when the halving event comes and Bitcoin mining becomes twice as hard, well, the price has to do something. And we've seen that it goes to 10X. So look at the Bitcoin chart over four years. Look for a four year Bitcoin chart, it's not one year. And you can see that there's a four year cycle followed by the halving event. And usually about 500 days after the halving event is when the price price spikes. 
So we're looking at like 2024, 2025 during that next like gold rush cycle. Yeah, 2025, maybe 2026. Really? It's usually yeah, the presidential election cycle. So maybe 2024, kind of like finishing off, end of 2024, beginning of 2025. Could be the, could be the, um, could not could be the pump, but that's when the halving is. Halving's on 2024 of May. It's usually 500 days after halving. So 2026 is, is when the price should spike, or kind of be in the highs. So for me playing the mining space, it's like, okay, I'm gonna put money in 2022, 2023, 2024, I'm gonna exit 2026. Really, so that's how you're preparing, you're investing into miners. Do you have your own miners on top of doing the hosting? Yeah, we do have our own miners, but like I said, we didn't take a large position over the past couple of years in the mining. Uh, more infrastructure, as the prices come down, we'll be looking at taking a larger position ourselves in the mining infrastructure and then running our own machines. And I guess for people who want to get into it, like from like a smaller budget to people who maybe have a little bit more money, do you have any things that you recommend they buy in terms of miners? Yeah, so the miner that you purchase, I would suggest making sure that you get hasher reports on to make sure that if it's a used miner, you know you know if it has any warranty left on Bitmain. If it doesn't have a warranty left with Bitmain or MicroBT, definitely try and negotiate the price down. Um, your biggest thing is gonna be, what's your electric rate? So if you're running at a five, six, seven cent electric rate, that's gonna be more important for you to get a more efficient machine. So you wanna spend more money on the machine because then it'll be more efficient over the longer term. If your energy rates are like three, low fours, two cents, you can buy less efficient machines for much cheaper and your energy cost is not gonna be as impactful because that machine won't be as efficient. So I would suggest like S19s are good machines, micro BT has made some good machines like the M30S++, but it really comes down to what's your energy rate is it better to invest in a farm and mine with a farm that has dedicated energy rate, a team, or and pay a little more on the fee, or is it better to run in your apartment? Now it gets really hot in the summer running a miner, so like kind of judging, okay, I'm gonna run in the mid-winter for a few months and find a spot during the summer, that also works out. Absolutely. So, and the last thing I kind of want to talk about is like pretty recently Ethereum switched to Ethereum 2.0, and a lot of those GPU miners got absolutely wiped out. So what are your thoughts on that? It's kind of crazy how like you're making money with the GPUs and then now Ethereum switched to something completely different. Yeah, I would say that, you know, when I got into GPU mining, they were talking about that. So in 2017, 2016, it was already being like, hey, we're going to go to proof of stake. And so people knew it was coming. What happens was I think a lot of the uneducated buyers jumped in the FOMO train to see how much money they can make from the GPU mining. Same thing with Bitcoin mining. They're looking at, okay, what is the return today? not what is the return over the lifespan of my asset. And then we extrapolate the same return we have today with what that should be two years from now. And it's like, okay, that's not true. But the theory being cut off immediately, it's like the writing was on the wall, guys. They kept saying it, they kept mm -hmm. saying it. If you if you have a large position in GPUs, you should have sh started selling them or prepared your devices for something else like machine learning or artificial intelligence and generating images, stuff like that. I think there's plenty of opportunity out there to still use GPUs, but the markets need built because Ethereum was kind of like supporting a lot of that GPU market. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think also, like at some point, I've heard that Bitcoin is going to stop being mined. Is there like a year that that's going to come? Yeah, so 2140, so 120 years from now. Oh, really? 18 years, yeah. So in 118 years, Bitcoin is going to stop being mined. That's a lot longer than I thought. Yeah. But over time, is mining going to become less efficient and you need more and more powerful Always equipment? Always more powerful equipment. Always more efficient equipment will come out because that's like, you know, the game name of the game is how fast can I turn one joule of energy into a terahash? And how efficient can I be in doing that? And so that's kind of where we are today. So S19s are 100 terahashes. The new machines coming out, S19 XPs are 140. But those aren't really new anymore. The next machine coming out are S19 XP Hydros. Those are 250. Wow. So in, by the time we're at 2026, we'll have machines that are about 1,000 mm -hmm. terahashes a second. So one machine will be as much as 10 S19s today. So in that facility, you can get a lot more density out of your hash rate in one facility than you know today. Hell yeah. So that's kind of how it's gonna change and machines are gonna be more efficient. Um, the Bitcoin reward is cut in half every four years to get to that 2140 date. So right now it's 6.25 Bitcoin, but soon it'll be 3.125 and then it'll keep down to one Bitcoin. So the thought process is, the theory is that the transaction fees, when you send Bitcoin across the network, you pay a small transaction fee, those will be able to support the Bitcoin miners on the network without any block or once that transitions fully mm -hmm. to transaction fees. Um, the other thought process is, is that Bitcoin price will go logarithmic because it will be denominating value and one Bitcoin is always one Bitcoin. 
versus like, okay, I'm gonna compare this Bitcoin against cash, but cash is different value depending on the time you're talking about it versus today, cash in the future. So cash in 2026, Bitcoin being at, let's say $300,000 in 2026, that's gonna be a lot less cash than it was, a lot more cash, a lot less cash than it was in 2010, $300,000. Mm -hmm. In 2000, $300,000. So the, what would denominate Bitcoin in also changes. So denominating in like scarce assets like gold, Bitcoin versus gold, Bitcoin versus stock market, Bitcoin versus real estate, and seeing how it compares against these other financial assets is important. And do you have any predictions for where you think Bitcoin's gonna be in 2026? Obviously no one knows, but. Yeah, I think so, above $300,000. Really? Least, yeah. So are you buying Bitcoin right now? We are, like I said, stacking stats, waiting for good times to take position in the market. I personally am dollar cost averaging in, but always you know, watching for the next dip. I think maybe you have 16K, you might have a dip down to 13K, but it's not gonna last. Like it's not gonna sit at 13K, I don't think. So you have a small dip, clears out the market, and then from there we can rally. For sure. Do you, do you, um, do you see Bitcoin going down to 10K? 12, so 12 and 13K was like the peak, was a, a really good support level in 2017. So I don't see it going to 10K, even though it did say 10K for a while, but I think like the 12 and 13K is a stronger support. For sure. Day. Awesome. So now as for the profitability of your mining facility, in January of 2022, you were earning a million dollars a month in revenue. Roughly like how much were you profiting on that? We're probably making close to 250 to $300,000 in profit. In those peak months. Before we paid employees and salaries and everything else, yeah. Okay, and as for like right now, how are things going? Like how is, how is it looking on like the... So, so right now at that one facility, that facility before Bitcoin dropped, so before end of November, um, beginning of November was at 70K, 75K in profit. And now, and then you have to pay you know, employees and everything else. So it's not a, on a machine basis, we're losing money on a corporate level because we have corporate debt, corporate overhead um, across our facilities. Right now we have 10 megawatts in operation in Iowa and we're deploying another 10 megawatts over the next two months. Once those are deployed, we'll be up to cash flow positive because we had to make the cuts and changes in the business to uh, restructure and ensure we can kind of focus on that cash flow positivity and ca uh, free cash flow. Um, and then the other site will probably profit, another five megawatt site, different arrangements on the contracts, but we'll make we have a partner on it too, but that'll make roughly 30 to 45K per month in profit. Okay, so have you had months recently where you've lost money? Oh yeah, I mean, we are losing in excess, like after debt service, oh, in excess of $100,000 a month. Really, so you're just going, you're just keeping, you're just using past earnings to, pay, to fund that right now? Past earnings and also services. Since we're a service company, we provide services to mining clients who want to build their own facilities, people who want to buy machines, people who want to run you know, run with their machines. So that's how I gave you the numbers, those are reoccurring numbers. So if you look at our business from a reoccurring basis, just on reoccurring cash flow, we're losing 100 to 150 grand a month. When if without reoccurring, we're, we're not including one-time sales, from, uh, if we include one-time sales, we're, some, we're making money okay. some months. But other months we do lose money and we do have to sell Bitcoin to pay for, that, uh, for those expenses and cover our debt. Have you noticed that more people are trying to get into Bitcoin mining right now or have you seen a decrease in interest? Definitely a decrease in interest. Um, but different players are starting to step in. So now it's like large investment funds, large real estate groups. Those are the guys who are coming into the space now who were looking at it maybe six months ago were like, this isn't the right time. They're putting the capital in versus the newer investors, retail investors, uh, real estate investors. They were coming in in January, February, March, April, May. So the smart people with a lot of money are getting in now where prices are low, whereas like the typical everyday investor was getting in when yeah. when everyone was greedy and prices were crazy, so. So what are you investing? Are you investing because of the emotional appeal, because you want to be part of the story, or you're investing because you have a strong thesis, like this is my thesis and this is why I'm investing? Okay, so, you, so you've been able to like not become as emotional because you've seen these dips before and you're just like consistently investing. Because I think you told me you invest like how much every month into Bitcoin, no matter yeah, what? Like two, two, three K a month easily, personally, you know, after my paycheck, after my bills, put it into Bitcoin every month. Um, it's super important to me is to be buying dollar cost averaging. As I look at it, obviously dollar cost averaging isn't a good idea because I'm buying Bitcoin at 60K when I could have been selling it, held my cash and bought it at 16K, but you don't know. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna take my cash flow, invest it in Bitcoin and keep acquiring sets. Uh, and always stacking, always stack. Awesome. Yeah, so I guess like, what are your thoughts on the fact that like all of these crypto exchanges are going bankrupt from like FTX, BlockFi just recently announced bankruptcy. I don't know if you saw that. 
Probably did. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a bunch of exchanges that are going bankrupt right now. And do you think that's affected the price of Bitcoin? Oh, a hundred percent has affected the price of Bitcoin and people's belief in the underlying like crypto ethos. I think for with exchanges, it's important to understand how these digital assets work. So. When you insert your money into an exchange, you're not a creditor, you're an unsecured creditor, debt creditor, I believe. So you're not getting, if there's a bankruptcy proceeding, you're the last one to get paid. So what happens with these exchanges is they invested in protocols, they took money out and they put it into some into different tokens. And those tokens, those bridges, they got hacked. And when they get hacked, if they lose money, they have to come up one-on-one with your deposit. They have to come up with that money. It's really impossible for them to do that because they're not making money on exchange fees. Mm-hmm. So I would say use centralized, don't use centralized parties and if you have, unless you have to. When you're using them, make sure that you're using some kind, some one that's been around for a while that shows proof of reserves. Um, I like Kraken, like Swan Bitcoin. Um, I like Bitfinex, Bit, uh, Bitstamp is one that's been around for a while. And Coinbase, you know, has high fees, but it's it's regulated and does have public is on the public market. So it's important to do your due diligence, but most importantly, it's don't keep your coins on an exchange. Take them off, self custody them yourself. Write down your wallet, your twelve code uh, key phrase. Give it to your parents. Give it to your grandparents, and that's how you should hold your money. Mm-hmm. So what about for you personally? Like, how much of your like Bitcoin are you actually holding on exchanges versus in like cold ledger storage wallets? I would say majority of our crypto is off exchange um, and that some of it's in cold storage. Some of it requires like three out of five withdrawals from people across the US on our team, biometric withdrawals um, and approvals and voice recognition. So there's a lot of things you can do to protect your coins and all of our client clients' coins that we hold. So that's something that we use Anchorage Digital for as our custodial partner, which are the first uh, Bitcoin exchange to have a banking license in the United States. Okay. Wow. So like in, in terms of like the FTX situation, which like very recently happened, what do you think about that? Because I know like there's a bunch of YouTubers even like promoting FTX, like it was like a big thing. And then now it turned out that that guy did a bunch of illegal stuff. Yeah. Not only YouTubers, but like Tom Brady. Right? Yeah. So like the massive in, the, in culture, massive penetration. I think that with the FTX debacle, it showed us the need for uh, proof of custody, proof of coins, and being able to have auditable systems. So moving from on, moving that all that off-chain activity when you go into Binance, you go into Coinbase, moving that to on-chain wallets, activities you can see and track, and also showed us like FTX was just complete fraud. Like what they were doing was they took customer money and they used it to build a hedge fund. If your hedge fund goes bankrupt or goes bust, it's supposed to go bust. It's supposed to say, hey, the hedge fund didn't work. And now returning the capital like to our investors. But what he did was he said, took that money from investors that had it in an exchange and even in the US exchange and gave it to his hedge fund. And he was trying to dig himself out of the hole. Then he bought companies like BlockFi, any people he invested in um, at their in their tokens or in their startups, they had to keep the money on FTX, which is huge. So then they lost all their money, they invested. So it was a bunch of like Ponzi like activities and a bunch of like Here's my left hand, but my right hand is something different. So do you think he'll end up going to jail? I, at this point, I do not think FTX will end up going to jail because it's been already almost a month since the first interview with Eric. And then a couple of weeks since he's like, allegations are coming out, bankruptcy, and you know, nothing's happened yet. That's kind of crazy. Like, I feel like he's clearly done some illegal stuff. He clearly has, but he's the biggest, second biggest political donor of the Democratic Party. He's donated to a bunch of people across both lines as well. And he has influence. He bought influence with his customer's money to protect himself from potentially getting going to jail. And what do you think about like maybe that turning people off from crypto? Like I feel like that for sure will. Oh, hundred percent. I think the next like crypto market or crypto bull, bull run will be less crypto, more Bitcoin. Really? Like, okay. Bitcoin is not going away. People believe Bitcoin. People understand that Bitcoin hasn't been hacked and it's a, no central party. And you know, if you're trusting someone like FTX, you're trusting a central party still. Yeah, I agree. I think all the stuff we saw in January with like all these random altcoins blowing up is pretty much going to be done with. It will always happen. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. It's just less. You know, yeah. This, this cycle is a little frothy. Yeah, for sure.